Earlier today, we heard a heartbreaking account of an event that affected our entire community. I'm here to tell you about my experience with the aftermath of that same effect, event. On October 1st, 2017, a gunman opened fire on the Route 91 Harvest Festival, a country music concert held in Las Vegas. Hundreds were injured and 58 were killed. Almost immediately, spontaneous makeshift memorials started to pop up all over the city. People left flowers, candles, stuffed animals, in median strips, along fence lines, and in front of buildings. Eventually, two main sites became the largest and best well-known memorial. One, the Las Vegas Community Healing Garden, was created in the days after the shooting, specifically to be a memorial. The other, at the iconic Welcome to Fabulous Las Vegas sign, the memorial formed around white wooden crosses dedicated to the victims. Now this memorial, located at one of the most visited sites in the city, caused a lot of issues for public officials. How to balance public safety concerns, the needs of tourists, and the obvious needs of the community to grieve. It, it brought up a lot of questions. How long should the memorial stay up? What should happen to the items once the memorial came down? Who should even be making these decisions? Who were the stakeholders and what rights did they have? And how does a city whose entire identity is built around the idea of having fun deal with a visual representation of tragedy at one of its most visited sites? Now, these questions are interesting in the abstract, but they become a lot more immediate when you become a stakeholder. Within two weeks of the shooting, it was determined that the items left at the welcome sign would be preserved. Since the median strip where that sign is located is on county property, it was only natural that it would go to the Clark County Museum where I am the registrar. Now, for those of you who don't know what a museum registrar does, and I suspect that's most of you, let me give you a rundown of my duties. I'm responsible for bringing in collection items to the museum. I do the legal paperwork for those items, catalog them, store them, and keep track of them. <clears throat> I've been doing this for about 20 years, and before I came to Las Vegas, I worked at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, so I was no stranger to items that had tragic histories. I was perhaps uniquely qualified to work on the items from this memorial. So the memorial was up for about six weeks, but during that time, the museum received deliveries of items that were deemed too fragile or too likely to become damaged. We had no idea what we were in for. The first delivery came a week and a half after the shooting in a pickup truck, a van, and a 25-foot trailer. For the next month, we received more deliveries, usually twice a week, and usually in that 25-foot trailer. Now, I have no idea how many items were actually at the memorial. If pressed, I would guess it was over 100,000 things. But most of those were flowers and floral arrangements, which we obviously couldn't preserve. We also had to restrict how many candles we accepted, and there were perishable items, food, things like that, that just wouldn't last in a museum collection. That still left over 15,000 artifacts. They all had to be cataloged, photographed, stored. Luckily, some members of the community stepped up, and I got a nice core of volunteers to help me. But, that wasn't even my focus in the weeks after the shooting, because suddenly I was the spokesperson for the museum and I had to answer everyone's questions about why we were taking the objects and what we were gonna do with them. I heard from family members of victims, survivors of the concert, people who left items at the memorial, the media, and just the generally curious. And one of the most popular questions I got was why is the museum preserving these items? Honestly, I didn't really know. I'd never really thought about these memorials before. Sure, I'd seen them in the background of news coverage of different tragedies. I'd been to places like the Vietnam Memorial. I even went to the World Trade Center not long after September 11th. And as a museum professional, I did think about whether they were being collected and what kind of challenges they would bring up. But I never really thought about the emotions behind them. What did these things mean to the people who left them or just to all of us? 
I have to admit, I'm a pretty cynical person at, at heart. So when I first started to think about what these things might mean, my first thought was, this was a way for people to insert themselves into the story, to become part of this. That's human nature, and it's not a bad thing, but it can sometimes come off as feeling a little unfeeling. In the weeks after the shooting, I combed through Instagram photos of the memorial. It was the easiest way for me to keep track of what was going on there. And in most of the photos that I looked at, people were very respectful, people seemed to really care. But there were a few where people were laughing, trying to look sexy, or the worst, doing that jump thing in front of and sometimes surrounded by thousands of tributes to the people who had died. Now, I probably shouldn't blame them. This is Las Vegas, and they were probably tourists, and this was what they'd come here to do. But it was a little jarring. And it didn't really, and it kind of fed into my thoughts about this. But as I started to receive the items from the memorial, and more importantly, as I talked to people who left items there, I began to change my mind. Just the sheer number of items, never mind the time that was clearly spent on creating them, seemed to say that something deeper was going on here. So again, I still needed to figure this out. What was the meaning of these memorials? I work at a history museum. My first thought, let's look at these in a historical perspective. How do these memorials fit into the history of public mourning, and what can it say about our time? So obviously, human beings have been leaving evidence of grief since we were running around with the Neanderthal. And over the years, we've left some pretty spectacular monuments to grief. The Egyptian pyramids, the Terracotta Army, and the Taj Mahal, just to name a few. But the Victorians famously codified public mourning. They literally wrote the book on it. There were rules on what you wore when you were in mourning, what kind of activities you could participate, and how your responsibilities changed based on your relationship to the deceased. But culture changes over time. World War I definitely rushed a lot of changes in. It was hard to have these elaborate, time-consuming mourning rituals when people were dying so quickly, and a lot of times you didn't even have a body for the funeral. Modern funeral practices became more popular, which meant people spent less time with the bodies of their loved ones, which of course changed the way they grieved. And you could even argue that modern medicine and better health meant that people had less experience with death in general. As society changed, people were expected to be more stoic, to repress those feelings. Of course, they still had the feelings, so it doesn't really surprise me that Feelings of grief would sort of express themselves in a variety of ways, including through memorials. Now, people who study these memorials trace their beginnings to the opening of the Vietnam War Memorial in 1982. The Vietnam War was the first televised war, which meant that for the first time, people were exposed to violent death in their homes. Mixed and passionate opinions about the war also made it hard for people to remain stoic and keep those feelings repressed. And then you had this wall, this dark wall with all the names carved into it. It really hit home the scale of loss. People started to leave items. Some of them had a personal meaning to one of those names on the wall, but some of them were just general mourning items that actually became more important to the people who came after them to look at the wall. After the death of Princess Diana, these memorials kind of started to pop up all over. They were no longer tied to a public, permanent memorial. People left the same flowers, candles, stuffed animals at places that were important to her life and to her death. By the time we had the Columbine High School shooting, the memorials were an accepted background to any kind of news coverage to these tragedies. And with the terrorist attacks on September 11th, such a big attack that the memorial spread far away from the cities that were affected. Every town in America seemed to have a memorial. Inevitably, in Las Vegas, the New York, New York Hotel and Casino became a memorial. People left shirts from first responder units from all around the country. Now, museums, of course, were paying attention. They understood that these memorials meant something important to us as a society, and they began to record them. And in fact, those first responder t-shirts from the New York, New York Hotel and Casino are in the UNLV library collection. 
As we had more tragedies and therefore more memorials, it became obvious that there were similarities in the way that we reacted. Each memorial was specific to the event and the city where it occurred, but there were meaningful and fundamental similarities between them. People left candles, flowers, stuffed animals, objects that may have a personal meaning to the people who had died or just may represent grieving in general. Items that are, may seem unimportant when taken at face value, but each item tells a story and taken together, they show an important part of our modern lives. But what do the memorials mean to the people most affected by these tragedies? The loved ones of the victims. While doing this research, I came across a study that acted as a turning point for me. A sociology professor at the University of Dayton named Dr. Art Gibson interviewed 309 people who had been involved with erecting memorials after the death of a loved one. Every single person that he interviewed said that the memorial was more meaningful to them than the gravesite in the cemetery. And I could see some of those feelings here in Las Vegas too. The family members of victims that I talked to were grateful that the museum was preserving items from the memorial. They saw it as a way to remember their loved ones and have everyone else remember them too. And they were comforted, if only a little, by knowing that the items were in safe hands. So obviously, cultural effects other than social media and trying to put yourself into the story are an effect here. As I talked to people who left items at the Las Vegas Memorial, I began to hear the same refrain over and over again. People just wanted to do something, but they didn't know what. Again, with no clear rules as how to express our grief, they just needed an outlet. Many people donated money to those affected by the shooting, and many gave blood. On the surface, those may seem more useful reactions to tragedy, but they didn't seem to have the same emotional impact as leaving an item, leaving an offering maybe, at a memorial. So it seems that these memorials are accomplishing what the people who left items at them set out to accomplish. They're doing something for the people who left the items, for the families of the victims, and for the community as a whole. This is why it's so important for museums and other cultural institutions to record these memorials. It's hard to recognize history while it's happening, but it is clear that these memorials are telling us something about our society, and future generations will thank us for acting now to save the items to tell this story. So it's been a long journey for me, both in the practical aspects of cataloging and dealing with the objects, and the emotional aspects of discovering what these memorials mean. I went from a cynical viewpoint to what I hope is a wider understanding of how these memorials help a community through difficult times. By learning about the history of public mourning, by talking to people who left items at the memorial or who just visited the memorial, and by talking to my volunteers, I feel I've reached a deeper understanding of what these memorials mean. They are useful, they help people, and they represent our community. And again, they will be important evidence for the future. So, I, along with about 20 dedicated volunteers, are cataloging, photographing, and rehousing thousands of objects. We are recording the physical description, the condition, and the dimensions of candles, flowers, painted rocks, and hundreds of handwritten notes. And I recognize as I do this work that I'm recording not just the items, but the stories they tell and the people who left them there. I'm honored to have the responsibility to preserve these items for posterity, and I hope that I'm giving back to the community in some small way. But most importantly, I'm glad that through this work, I too can do something. Thank you.